It is my pleasure today to introduce to you Mr. Stephen Lovegrove, Companion of the Order of the Bath, Permanent Secretary for Ministry of Defense, United Kingdom. Prior to his selection into the civil services, Mr. Lovegrove was a managing director in the corporate finance department of Deutsche Bank. Thereafter, he spent nine years as the shareholder executive of the Department of Business Innovation and Skills and finished off as the Chief Executive and Director General. Before joining the MOD, Mr. Lovegrove spent three years as the Permanent Secretary for the Department of Energy and Climate Change. Mr. Lovegrove attends meeting of the National Security Council, is Chair of the Civil Services Learning Board, and a member of the Civil Service People Board. May I invite Mr. Stephen Lovegrove to deliver the address. Distinguished fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me here today. I'm very pleased once again to be in India. Since my aunt arrived in India in 1937 and married an Indian and settled in Puducherry, my family and I have many fond memories of your wonderful country and never turned down an opportunity to visit. They are all suffused with the eternal sense of optimism here, but also with deep seriousness that I always encounter. Turning from the personal to the professional, as a civilian head of the UK's Ministry of Defence, I am also feeling tremendously energised at the moment, because defence and security is at the heart of our vision of global Britain. A Britain with truly international aspirations with worldwide reach and a 21st century military capability, with the will to make a difference for the common good. And not to forget a Britain with strategic interests in the Indian Ocean region. So it is a good time to speak to you as our two nations work to strengthen our maritime, military and security links. Our partnership goes back a long way. It's a hundred years since the end of the First World War in which both our nations gave so much in the fight for freedom. In the UK, we will never forget that over a million of your citizens freely volunteered to serve in that conflict and nearly 75,000 lost their lives. But our nations have much more in common than a history of shared sacrifice. We spend similar amounts on our armed forces, on sea, land, and in the air. And we are both taking a good, hard look at our military capability at the moment, of which more later. And, as this conference highlights, we have similar strategic views on the importance of our naval forces. Your Navy is one of the largest in the world, though in a couple of years we will have caught up with you in aircraft carriers with our magnificent Queen Elizabeth already afloat and the Prince of Wales soon to come off the wall, underlining our commitment to a truly global military reach. And our two fleets already work well together through the annual exercise CONCAN. Together, we keep shipping safe in the Indian Ocean region through the UK's Maritime Trade Operations Centre, which I see was, uh, was used by no fewer than 122 Indian flag commercial vessels in a single 24-hour period last week. We've put over 20 million pounds into the security of these waters since 2010, providing the northward base for the EU NAV4's operation at Atalanta. And for your part, the Indian Navy has made a massive contribution to the success of that long-running anti-piracy mission. But our similarities go deeper and make us natural allies in these troubling times. Our two great democracies are upholders of the rules-based international order at a time when others seek to impose their own norms of intolerance, authoritarianism and great power realpolitik. And our commitments to the global good are demonstrated across the world, 
India is the largest single manpower contributor to the United Nations peacekeeping and other missions. For our part, we're doubling our humanitarian efforts in Somalia and South Sudan, while safeguarding NATO's eastern frontiers and degrading Daesh as part of an international coalition. All the while, we stand shoulder to shoulder in the fight against the forces of terror and violent extremism, fully committed to strengthening the defense and international security partnership agreed during Prime Minister Modi's last visit to the UK. All this has been underpinned by a succession of high-level military-to-military visits over the last two years. Our Prime Minister was not exaggerating when she referred to India as our key strategic partner when she was here. And that was significant, for we now have a vision of a UK which is international by design, especially in regions where we have vital economic interests and valued partners like India. We've always been a global maritime nation, with a vested interest in keeping the sea lanes open and free, and the military clout to do so. Brexit does not alter that. In fact, it gives us an opportunity, a historic opportunity, to strengthen our partnerships across the world. And we mean to use that opportunity to the full, especially in the Indian Ocean region. So, to my main argument today, defense is one of the keys to delivering that vision and the time is ripe for India and the UK to do more together. After all, we face similar challenges. And as our Prime Minister said a couple of weeks ago in Munich, internal and external security become more and more entwined, and our ability to keep our people safe depends ever more on working together. <coughs> she was not only talking about terrorism and interstate conflict, but about the kingpins of piracy, people smuggling, and the illegal arms trade, each threatening the rules-based international system and free movement of goods on which our values and prosperity depend. So it's in our mutual interest to work together to tackle these shared threats. But there is opportunity here too. The Indian Ocean region might be your backyard. The Indian Ocean region is your immediate neighborhood and essential to your national security. But it is also essential to global re, uh, security. That is why we welcome Indian leadership and collaboration with others to preserve stability and balance. Undermining the freedom of navigation in any one of the world's great oceans threatens freedom of navigation in all the others, from the Baltic Sea to the Indian Ocean. For us, it's a, part of the vital, it's a vital part of the international networks on which we depend. 10% of our imports and exports go through the Gulf of Aden. That's 50 billion pounds worth of our overseas sales and 80% of our natural gas. Which brings me to trade. We are long established partners in defense with a strong record of working together. From HMS Hermes, or should I say your much loved INS Virat, to the Hawk Trainer, to our collaborations on the advanced multi-role combat aircraft engine and the Star Street missile. Defense exports are a key element of Global Britain and our shipbuilding strategy last year signaled our intent. We're building Type 31 frigates which don't just meet our own Navy's needs but are specifically designed for export for the first time since the 1970s. Now we're much better placed to make the most of our defense industry and I know you're actively supporting your own through the Make in India scheme. But trade, as has been mentioned before, is impossible without security. The oceans are a global commons, and that makes ensuring the free transit of commerce everyone's business. I'm pleased to see that we're already seizing the opportunities presented by our maritime partnership. The Royal Navy is demonstrating our commitment to this vital region by reopening its permanent base in Bahrain, HMS Sutherland is currently in Australia as part of her Asia-Pacific uh, Asia deployment 2018 in support of our security objectives in the Indo-Pacific region. Together, we're cooperating in the Novasar Satellite Surveillance Program to identify potential threats. The Joint Shipping Information Exchange Agreement will soon be complete, and we're improving our shared hydrographic data. 
But I would like us to go further still with stronger Navy-to-Navy -Navy collaboration, including possible training exchanges. We should also be building on the excellent work already done on the blue economy, which was the subject of this conference last year. Not least because of the value of sustainable economic development in the Indian Ocean region, which has been put at $22 billion. And there's an important role for the Commonwealth here. So we are very pleased, and we hope and expect Prime Minister Modi will attend the Heads of Government meeting in April in London. India has over half of the Commonwealth's population, after all. The dangers we face are not only evolving rapidly, they transcend borders and continents, and they must be countered with truly international collaboration. We agree that security in the blue economy are legitimate concerns of the Commonwealth. Now we have a real opportunity to re-energize it and make it relevant for future generations. And I would be particularly grateful for your thoughts and ideas about how to do that. I'd like to conclude by outlining the UK domestic context in which we want our partnership with India to flourish. My department is just embarking on that good hard look at capability I mentioned at the outset, responding to the rapid pace of change by reforming our defense organization from top to bottom and ensuring we have the capability to meet the challenges of the future. You blazed this trail last year with your own Joint Armed Forces Doctrine of April 2017, and I'm struck by some of the real similarities in our approaches. Your doctrine talks about the changing nature of conflict, how it is becoming unrestricted, unpredictable, and hybrid. That's very close to our own reading of the situation and very close to our own experience in Europe as is your assessment of the importance of the complete and effective interoperability with countries big and small. That's where we're coming from as well, and our modernizing defense program will consider all opportunities open to us for alliance, partnership, and engagement in the new international situation. We are also looking for even more value for money from our head office and our procurement arrangements areas I know that India is intensely interested in. We can learn a great deal from each other. My department and our armed forces are always happy to share their expertise with our friends overseas, especially in these dangerous but exciting times. We now have a real opportunity to build on the progress we saw during the Prince of Wales's visit a couple of months ago, accelerating our defense partnership particularly in the maritime sphere, where we've worked together so successfully in the past. I echo our first Sea Lords priority for 2018. Expanding the UK's maritime horizons as we take our nation's message of partnership and prosperity across the globe. Your part of the world is central to that because we are more than just old friends. We share core values and a will to act in the defense of the common good. In other words, we have all the makings of a modern strategic partnership, a partnership which I hope and expect to become ever closer in the future. Thank you.